Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. A really interesting guest today. I don't have any children, but this wonderful woman, Lindsay Milas, has delivered over 1,500 of them. She's been practicing since 2004 as a traditional spiritual midwife. This is also known as midwifery, but really today was a deep historical education of the process of growing a baby and having the baby and how that's changed so much over the last 500 years and some of it was changed 500 years ago and is still the way it is right now which is not natural there's so much not natural about the process so we talked about everything from circumcisions which is something she's very passionate about not about i should say food to the energetics to letting go to infertility and and so many different aspects of it and then of course just the modern medicine and and what it's like to have a baby naturally at home as she did under the stars versus something where you're going to a hospital and you might be getting a c-section or you might be getting pumped full of drugs that will dilate you and, and really taking away your power. So today's episode, which I think is so valuable for a man and a woman because obviously there's so many men out there that are fathers, to really understand what is happening with childbirth and how important it is for a woman to go through the natural process and to feel and grow in her power and that there is magic in doing this right and doing it the way it used to be done so long ago. Of course, modern medicine plays its role, but doesn't need to play a role for everyone all the time. Thank you for listening. Please hit the subscribe button. Um, deeply appreciate that. And of course, your comments and the bell for notifications. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means that there's lots of salt and no sugar. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to any diet or lifestyle. For me, I drink Element all day, every day. I put it in just about every single drop of water that I drink. For me, it feels like it helps keep me full. It helps give me more energy. And I feel like water is absorbed better by the body when it has element in it. It truly feels like magic to me. Receive a free element sample pack with any order when you use drinkelement.com slash pretty intense. That's drinkelement.com slash pretty intense. I think I wanted to start with like the history. Like, I think that was what was so striking when we, you left me some voice notes and you were kind of telling me about stuff. I'm like, oh shit, people need to know the history of childbirth, of the process leading up to it, mm -hmm. that whole experience. And then, I mean, just giving birth itself feels like something that modern science has really twisted. So totally. like, what is, what is, what is the occult? also known as hidden truth about like what we don't know or what we aren't remembering or taught about bearing a child and giving birth. Yeah. Okay. So I, I really want to start first with like a deep breath together, because I feel that as we move into this topic and as we move into the energy of this, like us, like women, we're like blah, 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 all the time. And like, that's not where this lies. Like this is like deep, 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 deep within our bodies. And so mm -hmm. anybody that's listening, me and you, like if we kind of yeah. like really get into our bodies right now and just take a nice collective deep breath together. So breathing in through our noses, all the way down through our lungs into our sacred wombs. If you don't have a womb, you have that creative power and just kind of feeling, embodying this moment, because right now we're going to move through some deep history, some dark history, and also come back to this deep remembering that we have within our bones, that we have within our DNA, that's back many, many lineages of women that have come before us. And so as we just settle into that energy and just move away from the fast paced modern life, we're able to receive this energy better. So the first thing, you know, that we can kind of move into with that hidden energy that birth brings is that it used to not be hidden. And it's something that throughout all of time, women have known the power that comes from birth. The power that comes from birth is something that I'm really familiar with, right? Like I've attended over 1500 women in their power. I've seen um, the portal, like basically I call myself the portal keeper. Like I, I'm in between worlds most times. And it's this deep transformative power 
that comes from within that we basically say that we can't do it anymore. And in that moment, we get to tap back down into a strength that we never even knew that we had and do it. And so it's this power, it's this mystery, it's this thing that can't be controlled. It's sensual, it's sexual, it's ecstatic, it's hard. It's, it, you know, it takes us to the the depth of the end of the universe and back into our bodies. Like I always say, we have to go to the stars to retrieve our babies. And so when that is placed into a box, when that's placed into a checkbox, when that's placed into a hospital, when that's placed into a book that Western medicine says, this is how it's done and this is how we do it, it takes away all that magical reverence that comes with it. Hmm. And so, you know, I, I always say like, I'm not all or nothing. Like I'm not a person that stands on, on one side of the fence and says like, we don't need that. Like, no, I know there's a time and a place always for Western medicine. Like, you know, it's, it's a, one of those things that throughout the last 23 years of my life, like I've, I've used it many times, but appropriately. And childbirth is a normal physiological process. So in my practice, uh, you know, I can look at like the C-section rates as a comparison here. So um, we can go anywhere from hospitals that have really good C-section rates at around 25% to a hospital down the road from me that has a C-section rate of around 50%. What should it be? So if you take out all of the new high risk, like IVF, women being pregnant over the age of 45, like all these other things that kind of come into play, Mm -hmm. the World Health Organization recommends that it sit anywhere around 15%. In my practice, and I have low risk women, so I know that there's a different variation here. I maybe get to around 4% per year, maybe. So there's a big difference in that yeah. statement right like you're you're looking at somebody who has a 4% cesarean rate and who has women that have wildly transformational experiences where they lock eyes with me at the end of their experience and tell me that it completely changed their lives to a woman that has a cesarean that's laid flat on an operating bed in the middle of an operating room with, you know, bright lights, cold temperature, people talking, Mm. 15 people in the room. Mm. And it completely takes away from that spiritual experience that comes with birth. Now Mm. I've had both experiences. My daughter was a C-section, which is what prompted me to get into childbirth. And then my son was born in my backyard in my jacuzzi underneath the stars. So I know personally the difference of those two experiences. And so that's where we got to kind of get to come back to this place of remembering, right? Like, yeah. yeah, not everybody has to give birth at home. I don't give a shit if you give birth at home. But what I want you to know is that you get to have a transformative experience even Mm -hmm. if it's in the hospital and you, you get to know that there are certain things that you get to ask for in order for that to happen. And in order Mm -hmm. for the birth process to happen in a way that it's not controlled. So I had my daughter super young, right? I was 21 years old. I was already in healthcare. I was working in a hospital and I just went along with what everybody did. During the surgery, I actually felt everything. The anesthesia wasn't working properly. So I was like, like actually thinking that my insides were getting ripped open. And I've had countless women that have messaged me and been like, oh my God, the anesthesia wasn't working for me. I felt everything too. So I know it's an experience that women have. Yeah. And all of my power was stripped. I was tied to a bed, you know, like my arms were like crucified on both sides. And I was tied to a bed as I was waiting for this baby to come into my arms. Now, I asked to be put to sleep during that surgery just because it was there was so much pain. But when I woke up, I laid eyes on my daughter and completely fell in the deepest love I've ever felt in my whole entire life. I know that's not a common experience. I know there's a lot of women that have the experience of being so out of body during the surgical experience that they're kind of like, out of it. who's that baby? Like, oh my gosh, I know I'm supposed to bond with this baby, but I'm not really bonding with this baby. I feel like shit. Um but I, I just, you know, I grabbed her and basically never let go of her. We had amazing parenting together. I parented her, you know, she was this, what we call attachment parenting. Like she was breastfed and she was in a sling all the time and she slept right next to me and I was attuned to her every need. And I, I knew in that moment and it, 
you know, with the months passing that something had been robbed from me. Like there was an innate rite of passage that was actually taken from me. And I couldn't put it into a word and I couldn't describe it to anybody else, but it was this knowing that I had within my soul that something was missing. And so I started just racking through information and that was back in 2002. So, you know, like Google was kind of a new thing back then. And I was like, there has to be some way for me to not like be in this experience ever again, but also to help women not have the same experience that I just had. So I, you know, was like, did the right things. Like I went to like become a childbirth educator and I taught childbirth classes in the hospital. And then I became a doula and a doula is somebody that's a little bit different than a midwife. So midwives are providing medical care for that woman, for that family throughout their whole entire pregnancy into the birth and through the postpartum period. A doula is someone that's there specifically for physical and emotional support. So they're still there giving you really good information, but they're not there in the medical aspect. Um, They don't have like the liability, so to speak, of what what midwives do. So I became a, a doula and I was working in the hospital. And every time I went to a birth in the hospital, I was horrified. I was like, what is going on? Everything I'm doing, it doesn't even matter. Like it, there's nothing that I'm changing. I hmm. felt like an actual accomplice to a crime in most situations. Like I was sitting in a room watching all of these horrific things happening, sitting on my hands. One thing specifically that stood out to me was how babies were treated at birth. And so what I saw is these babies where the cord was cut and they were whisked away into a warmer, away from their mom. Um, I'm going to give you a a little brief lesson on normal physiological cord closure. So what the first thing that you think of when you are watching a movie or a TV show, like, or like someone's giving birth in the back of an ambulance, what's the first thing that they call for? A cord clamp, right? Like, how do we cut the cord? What do we do with the cord? And now I want you to imagine like a farm right? There's goats, there's cows, there's horses. You're watching any mammal over the whole entire world give birth. And and it's really interesting to think that we think that we need a device for something that has worked perfectly for however many years, right? Like birth is intended to work or we wouldn't be here today. There is no farm animal. There is no mammal that is born with the baby holding a cord clamp saying, please clamp my cord. Okay. And so when we stop that process, the baby actually is born into a state of physiological shock. They lose their blood supply that is actually theirs and stored in the placenta. So automatically, right away, they're like, what is this world? My blood supply is gone. It's cold. It's bright. Where's my mom? What's this oxygen for the first time? What's this oxygen? Yeah. Like I, they're actually moving the fluid through their lungs for their first four or five breaths in order to even get oxygen into their lungs. So all of that is happening in super, this fast paced way. And then they're, you know, away from their mom and they're under these bright lights. And so all of us are starting life in a state of physiological shock, right? And so when I saw all this happening, like I said, I felt like an accomplice to a crime because I'm like, this isn't how it has to be. And I really didn't even know much other than this birth because that's the only birth that I had seen up into that point. So then I started my quest for like, uh, get me out of here. Like I need something else. Yeah. One of my mentors was like, I'm starting uh, one of the first midwifery schools in California. You should join. And I was like, okay, like, let's, let's do this. And so I started that process. And in the middle of the process, I was pregnant with my son. And um, then I was seeing normal physiological births at home because part of the schooling is also going in and mentoring another midwife in the community and Mm -hmm. getting all of your numbers and hours in for, for your licensure, so to speak. And that's how it was throughout all of time. Apprenticeship was always the way that midwives worked. Yeah. Um, And so you know, I'm, I'm in this space of knowing that things can be totally different. And so that's the energy that I took into my son's birth. Now, trust me, there were still things I had to work through that were deeply ingrained into my soul that I, you know, the trust like... that system. So like, first of all, you're becoming a, a mother either for the first time, second time, third time, whatever, but you're becoming a new mother to this baby, right? So this is, this is a new aspect of parenting. You've never parented this child before. If you have any mother wounds, if you have any father wounds, those things are going to come up in birth. Which we all do. Which we all do. Even if you have the greatest parent in the world, right? Exactly. And it's so so those things are very apparent 
either throughout the prenatal process or throughout the birth. And even if you thought that you've done a lot of work throughout the prenatal process at like, you know, like really clearing through all of that trauma, it tends to kind of show its face if, mm -hmm. if there's something there. Another thing that I've seen come up, and this wasn't my experience, mm -hmm. but if you've had any sexual abuse in the past, so one in three women are supposed to be, have had some sort of sexual abuse in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a, a really in-depth questionnaire when I go through all of my clients and, and on there, it says like, even if you don't feel comfortable in this moment, just please know that any sort of sexual abuse can make its way into your birth. Here are some resources. Maybe wait and see a couple of months and see if you feel comfortable sharing this experience with me. It's on the table. They know that that's something that's on the table. Mm. And there's times where no one has discussed it with me. And I know immediately if there's sexual, birth, sexual abuse in a birth. And the husbands look at me like, how did you know that? And it's like, if there's certain things that women say, because you're losing complete control. You're going into a divine surrender. But if you've lost control before of your sexuality, it's usually not in the best sense of the word. So it, it kind of replicates how the abuse happens. So like there's, there's, there's women that sound like uh, you know, if they were, if they had sexual abuse when they were five, they kind of go back and revert back to the five. sound of being five. Um, right. it's, it's, I mean, it shakes you to your core to witness mm -hmm. it. I moved through my birth with my son. I had a beautiful labor. It was relatively quick for all things considered. It was the middle of summer. It was hot. We were in and out of the pool all day. And then, like I said, he was born under the stars in my jacuzzi. So I left that experience like completely recalibrated to my core. Like I was like, Oh, this is the rite of passage that I missed mm -hmm. out on. And that postpartum experience was totally different in a sense that not that I didn't have any problems bonding with my daughter. And I was, you know, super bonded to my son, but I knew in that moment that I could do anything. And that has carried with me through the rest yeah. of my life. So is it the difference between being in a situation where you're at the hospital and they are doing a lot of the work or they're medicating you and they're sort of like, there's too much intervention with the process that when you're doing it at home, it's like someone telling you, you need to go do some crazy workout. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. And then you push through and you get done. You're like, yes. And you feel so totally. strong. It's yeah. like, you've actually done it. You're, yeah. You don't even know how you're going to do it. Yeah. But you go and you come out of it because you actually had to do a lot more work. You had to go into yourself, which is why when you get squeezed, the worst comes out, right? That's mm -hmm. where the truth comes out. I say worst, but it's really just like the wounds and all that. And so it's because it's harder, right? I mean, is it, I mean, am I getting that wrong? I mean, no, it's more rewarding. It's, it's right it's on. More connective, but it's harder. And you yeah. have to have confidence. You have to trust the people around you. You have to trust yourself. You have to be able to let go. You yeah. have to be able to push through pain. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to breathe through things. You have to be able to go to another place sometimes, probably. That's why you come out of that so much more empowered and powerful is because you're in your power. You finally start to realize some of your potential as a yeah. human being and what 100%. you're capable of. Yeah. I mean, it's liken it to like, if you were to go run a marathon and you, you did all this training and then they're like, we're going to give you an epidural and you're going to be numb through the entire experience. Yeah. And when you cross that finish line, it wouldn't be the same as you having yeah. to push yourself at that last, you know, three mile mark at that, you know, at that 15 mile mark where you're like, oh my God, I can't go any further. No kidding. And so if you compare the two like that, it's like, oh, well, that makes sense. Um, now, again, there's always a time and a place for, you know, an epidural or a C-section, but like the majority of births are supposed to be unintervened with, uncontrolled, and allowed to happen normally. A lot of things that we see right now is with induction. So induction of birth is where we actually start to give medication to ripen the cervix, to open the cervix, and to have contractions right. to birth the baby. And then I always like to look at a flower, right? If you were to sit and watch a little bud, and it was starting to open, and we started to peel back every single petal, right, forcing it to open. What would it look like, right? It and so ready. It's, it, would, no, it would. No, it wouldn't be, be ready. It just wouldn't yeah. be ready. No, it and look it would right. look like a floppy flower, right? And so it's the same thing that, like, once we start thinking that we can like force this thing to open, and yeah. we can go in and like, you know, force dilation and force contractions, like we don't know what we're missing out on. We don't know what the the potential of that beautiful blossoming flower would be if we just left right. it alone.
Right. Well, there's that. I'm actually really curious because it feels like, and again, I have no children. My sister has four. Um, Mm -hmm. Like I've heard about stuff and all my friends have kids, but for the most part, but tell me what the, tell me what the trade-off is between waiting for the flower to open versus it feels like there's a lot of women that decide to schedule a Mm -hmm. birth. Mm-hmm. Like, would there, what's the reason why you would schedule and like, why, like, what should, what is the trade off? Like, what, what are you sacrificing by saying, I'm going to plan this versus wait for it? Like, what, what do you need to be ready for if you'd make that kind of decision for yourself and your baby? Yeah. So obviously there's medical reasons for induction, right? But stepping outside of that, all it does is it comes back to this level of control. When we think we control something, we miss out on all of the magic, all of the mystery, all of the transformation that comes with that divine surrender. So this is something that like, it's not, we're not supposed to know. Like if I knew when babies were going to be born, my life would be so much easier, right? Like yeah. I wouldn't be up at three o'clock in the morning and I wouldn't We would have miss... done this interview like four months ago when yes, we had a plan. <laughs> totally. You said, Sorry, two babies are coming today. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, you know, we just live in a culture that we just can't jump into that divine surrender. And it's, it's something that like, is a really important piece to have. It's a really important thing that we gather into moving through the rest of our lives because I mean, really, do we really control anything? Like, like, do we, like, you know, people are birth and death are on the same end of the spectrum, you know, one's over here and one's over here, but like, we don't know when we're going to die. You know, like it's, it's like you, we could get in a car and like uh, tomorrow everything's over. And so it's, it's like really being in that reverent space that, Mm -hmm. Um, we get to be in a, a state of surrender. Mm-hmm. I think this is an easy like transition to talking a lot about the energy of growing the baby, having the baby, connection with the baby. Mm-hmm. I mean, we could go in. I want to also go into like things like infertility and like how the energy works with all of this stuff. So what are some of the main issues that come up with the women that you're working with and probably has to do with also the men, right? Like, cause it's all connected. Of um, but what are some of the main things that come up for these women where you give them energetic direction? The basis of my foundation of how I practice comes from the Association of Pre- and Perinatal Psychology and Health. Their website's birthpsychology.org. And they've been around for a long time. Like the the heads of this organization for forever were, you know, like these like 70, 75-year-old women and men that have been like begging the medical community to wake up to knowing that the baby is aware and that the baby is a conscious being and that the mother and baby are one unit. And, um, you know, I mentioned my hospital experience of these babies being whisked away. And that's really why I came into a home birth practice is because I wanted to welcome babies in a much different way. And Mm -hmm. not to say that mom's experience of birth isn't equally as important, but they're, they're, you know, they are, they're one unit. And it's really important how we navigate through preconception, conception into the prenatal process through the birth and then into the postpartum period, because, you know, this is our future generation. And, and we know that if babies are brought into a world that's full of stress, um, that, you know, moms are in a prenatal period of, of just sitting in nothing but fear or, you know, 2020 is a perfect example here. Right. So, um, I've, I've been, uh, witnessing births for almost 20 years. And when 2020 happened and the world shut down, like, you know, you can kind of liken it to a war or something that's really scary because nobody really knew what was going on in the beginning. And so I had these moms and remember, these are moms that are seeking something that's totally natural. They're in a a home birth midwifery practice and they have direct access to their care provider to move through their fears and stress. Okay. So this is like way above what is normal for what the majority of women were experiencing during 2020. Yeah. I have never in my entire life seen the outcomes, the 
experiences that those babies were coming into the world with. And I'm like, these babies are just literally stewing and this amniotic fluid that is full of cortisol and Mm. they are like they're like do i really want to come to the world at this time and these babies would be born and i mean they they you know would come into their bodies but like you would see them look around the room and there's this special moment where they kind of lock eyes and lock energy with different people that are their welcoming committee is what i call it the sacred welcoming committee mm. and so many and times we're talking that, about energies in the room right we're talking about in, right like well we're talking about like, something that they can see is sort yes. of in the field that yes. we don't have the we have blocked out or we yes. have taught ourselves to not see we've blocked it out and then and then these these babies come in and they're like do do i want to be here like your fault is it your fault yeah am i here yeah and and so you know i i made it a purpose and i and i'm thankful that this hasn't played out over the last year in my practice but like almost every single baby i was like you chose to come now we need you now you need to breathe we breathe air here. We breathe air into our lungs. And we are so grateful that you chose now to come. And like with those few words, you could see them kind of like, okay, maybe this is where I want to be right now. And, but they were all slow to start. They, you know, they took a while to like take their first breaths. Like I, you know, I use a lot of like sound energy sometimes like, okay, like this is the earth. You're here. This is your body. Like you're outside like of your them. mom now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those are things that like, you know, guides during like medicine ceremonies will do. They have feathers, they have, you know, sounds, they have drums, they have all kinds of things. And I always feel like it's to ground you. It's to like, go, you're here. For Remember? Sure. For connect sure. you to connect you to earth. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, you know, like that was what I was doing. It was, it, you know, the, the whole world was on an ayahuasca journey in 2020, but these babies were as well. And so everybody that was ushering in these babies were the the shamans that had to freaking ground them into their bodies. Yeah. You were a shaman for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause like I said, now that's shifted a little bit. So we're not in this perpetual state of fear and what's going to drop next. I mean, I'm sure there are some people that are still living in that state of fear, but, um, now I'm like, oh, these babies are coming in as warriors, you know, like, like they're like, uh, oh, I'm here. Like, I'm going to tell you that I'm here. Right. Yeah. What do you think about the idea that, um, cause you know, for people that are like down the spiritual path, there's like, you know, the waves of volunteers and the indigo children and crystal children. Um, and someone explained it to me where basically the, the planet's frequency is, is changing. It's, it's rising. It's, Uh, And so each incarnation, like the, the children that are born into that frequency are already loaded with that new frequency. Yeah. So they already, already they've already had the download. Yes. And that when the, the, the the generations before just weren't born, born into that frequency. So they, they just takes a lot more. They might never get there. Um, What do you think about that? Oh, I totally agree with that. And I can see it. Like it's something that's palpable in the room. Um, even with the difference of a couple years from 2020 to now, like the difference of the energy of these babies is I call them like light warriors. Like they are super high vibration, but they are strong and they are like, we are not going to take any more of these generational curses. Like this, this like lineage shit that's been in our family's history for the past, you know, few millennial, it's done. Like no more of this, no more victimhood. Like we're here to elevate. Um, and that's like, totally what I'm feeling. And I'm covered in goosebumps as I say it, because it's yeah. something that I just, you know, I'm, I'm in the energy of a lot and I'm just super grateful to see the shift and change with that. Yeah. I had a cool experience where my mom's mom passed away and she kind of came through and some body work stuff that I was doing some somatic stuff within body work. And yeah, those are some of the things like I've, I've always, I've felt like there's like an ancestral role to play, but she was like, you're the one we've been waiting for to like break this codependency curse with men and, and self-sacrifice and, and not, not being sovereign in our, power. And, um, and so I feel that I I feel I've felt that so deeply. So maybe that's like an interesting place to go into before we go into that really quick. I like want to honor that because 
I want like everybody that's listening to really take another deep breath and embody that because that's the the common message that I keep hearing. And you just had this beautiful affirmation of it. Like we and these babies being born are the the souls that our ancestors have been waiting for truly like, like we really get a step out of this victimhood. We really get a step out of this codependence and we really get a step into sovereign beings. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That in. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. To say yes. Right. Mm-hmm. It's to say yes. It's to not be afraid. It's to part of me thinks that when you're here to do something, you're here to do it. And, um, there's no other way, but it still takes a little conviction to go, no, no, no. I feel like I'm always like, it's me listening to, have you ever heard of Dolores Cannon? Mm-hmm. Like she's passed away, but she's a hypnotherapist mm-hmm. and she would always, I'd listen to so many hours of Dolores and she would say, you know, if you get, you get it wrong, you got to come back again and do it. Maybe you'll yeah. flip positions. Maybe you'll be the guy instead of the girl or whatever it is. And I'm like, all I keep thinking is like, I'm not going to come back and do it again. I'm not going to get all the way to 35 or 40 or whatever my age is to have to learn this lesson. I'm going to get it right this time. I don't know how far into sort of ancestral memory you get. And like um, also um, the imprinting that the mom has on the baby with even things like um, the food choices they make or the thoughts that they have, the viruses that they get during whatever. Like how is that all imprinting the baby? So let's start first with food as medicine, right? So anything that is entering our bodies ever, but especially during pregnancy, is basically a a medicine, a light code, if you will, of what gets to be the genetic imprint of our babies. We know, you know, uh, Joe Dispenza, you have Bruce, uh, Bruce, Bruce Lipton, Lipton. Yeah. all of these people that come in and are so aligned with like saying like, you know, genes can be turned on, genes can be turned off, but it's also mm-hmm. like the genetics. Yes. And it's also the power that we have with our thought. And so, um, you know, obviously like nutrition is one of the most important pieces of the care Mm. that I give. And that is making sure that Mm. the the woman is taking care of themselves. You know, like you're, you're housing a baby. You're not only housing a baby, you're, you've grown an organ that feeds this baby. And, uh, you know, we, we know that with, with poor nutrition, with poor choices, smoking, drinking, all of those things that, it, it, the house isn't, it's either like a palace or it's like a shack. And so we obviously want to make the right choices to house our babies in a really good, um, space. And so, um, you know, that's something that's talked about, but I, you know, when we go back into the imprinting of, uh, throughout all of history, you know, like chances are that maybe your grandma or great grandma was raised during the great depression and they were eating junk canned food unless they were on a farm or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these periods of famine, um, and demineralization, if you will, are also part of that story. And so, um, as we move more into the quantum field, we really get to make the choice to deprogram that from, from where we're at and, um, you know, make those decisions that creates a better environment for our babies to be grown in. Mm -hmm. What about the field around like EMFs, you know, telephones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth ear, Bluetooth watch, like, is there any recommendations you have with what you, when you're yeah. working with women to eliminate? Yeah. I mean, I wish this was studied more, but obviously it's not. And um, yeah, I mean, I recommend like put a timer on your Wi-Fi in your house. Please don't wear the the EMF watches, the Apple watches, the Fitbits. I had one mom that I, sh- she pulled up her shirt and she had a Fitbit attached to the inside of her underwear, like literally right oh, next to the baby's wow. head. I was like, oh my God, <gasps> take that off right now. You know? And so we just don't know the effects. We don't know the long-term effects of this. This is all new. I mean, it's within our, you know, I mean, I went to high school and had a pager. There wasn't even a cell phone back then. So mm. We just don't have the long-term studies with it, but I I can tell you that my knowing, my deep, you know, womb knowing is Mm -hmm. that we should avoid those as much as possible while growing a baby, while raising a baby, you know, like screen-free kids is a really 
good thing. Like, you know, we're not like raising these zombies that are like staring down at their phones 24 yeah. seven, um, getting out in nature, getting our feet in the dirt, you know, it's, those Grounding. are all really important things that that was always in, in place, you know, for all of our ancestors. We never, yeah. they never had any of these modern day things. Yeah. What about a mom and earthing? Like, oh, it's so important. So a, a big piece of, of my practice is, yeah, you can see right here, there's a door behind me and, um, my, my, my room is, I call it the therapy room too. So if I have somebody that comes in here that needs a good cry, needs a good grounding, needs a good earthing, we go straight out the back door. Like it's, it's part of prenatal care and we take our shoes off and we put our feet into that dirt and we root down, you know, through mm -hmm. everything underneath us into the core of the earth. And, um, we, we spend time in breath together and we, you know, bring up that energy and, um, just kind of return back to that, that normal cycle that we've had a part of our daily living for, for so long. What is the recommended amount of weight to gain during pregnancy? So I try to take the numbers out of it. Um, you'll see anywhere from like 25 to 35 pounds is a normal amount of weight to gain. And now in my practice, I have the cream of the crop, right? Like people are coming in already health savvy because they're choosing home birth. So I don't like say count calories or weigh yourself or do right. this or that. I basically say eat intuitively. Like I want you to listen to your body in this moment. And like, you know, like if you feel like you need to have a steak, go have a steak. If you feel like you need to go and have like aloe vera juice to, you know, have, you know, good movement within your intestines, go do that. Like there's just so many things that um, because the women coming in already have a previous, typically have a previous knowledge of, of nutrition that they get to be really intuitive with their eating. And you look, I mean, gosh, you can see all the celebrities. They're like, you know, I'm craving McDonald's or I'm like eating Slurpees. And you're like, that's such bullshit. That's because you've starved yourself your entire life. And now this is your opportunity to overeat and indulge. Isn't it the truth? Isn't it yeah. The and it's like, that's just crazy. Like you, you're growing a baby. Let's go back to that house that you're creating for this baby. It doesn't well, need slurpees. This is, this is like the original. I don't know how, I, I mean, I've done a lot of inner child work and I literally try and look at my inner child, like my child, mm -hmm. because it helps me make better decisions because I can self-sacrifice on myself. Mm -hmm. But if this was literally my child, my daughter, I would never let someone treat her that way. I would never feed her that. I would never do that to her. Like I would never let someone continue to do something that was da damaging or emotionally distressful. Like I just wouldn't. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is, but you're actually, when you're pregnant, truly with your child, yeah. you're not using it as sort of like an Im imaginary sort of scenario. It's truly happening. So why would you feed your child? Da your daughter or son Popeyes, why would you feed them, you know, 48 ounces of Coca-Cola? Like, yeah. why would you, why would you do those things? Um, do you find that the women that um, sort of go off the deep end like that, do they, which you probably don't see that much of, but you have seen a lot, I'm sure. Yeah. So is, does, does that lead to um, overweight children? Do they have, does it become imprinted on them or is it maybe more of like just that, all of a sudden they're in that environment still. I mean, you know, again, there's not a lot, a whole lot of research on it. So I, what do I think? I think that there's definitely the potential there for it, right? Like if you're creating those habits in utero, that's an imprint. That is a primal cellular imprint into that yeah. child. Mm -hmm. And then most of the time it, they're coming out into that same imprint. So, you know, like sure. it's, it's, it's same the pattern. same environment, same pattern that's created again. And, yeah. uh, you know, you see there was one celebrity uh, who you could, you know, she was, you following them, seeing them post all these pictures. And I'm like, towards the end of her pregnancy, I'm like, oh, she's got preeclampsia. And everybody's like, how do you know? I'm like, I, she, she has preeclampsia. And the next Which like, is couple what? of days, uh, preeclampsia is a uh, condition in pregnancy where it's elevated blood pressure. The liver starts to get out of whack. I mean, it's, it's a medical problem. Um, it's a reason to induce for labor. And, you know, this particular celebrity was induced three days later for preeclampsia. It was like, well, no shit. Of course she has preeclampsia. You know, I can spot it a mile away. Um, yeah. But, but it goes back to, I'm sure the nutritional choices that she made throughout her pregnancy were crap. So yeah. you, if you're not nourishing your body, if you're not getting the protein, if you're not, you know, getting that good water, you're not grounding, you're not moving. That's what's going to happen. What about the 
sort of recommendations that doctors have had in the past of like, don't have deli meat, don't have sushi, all that. Is that, I mean, is there a lot of validity to that? Or all based in that- liability. All based in liability. So, you know, you look at Japan. Do you think there's women that aren't eating sushi? Everybody's ah, still eating totally. sushi, right? If you look back, uh, still, like if you look at any Amish farmers, they're all drinking raw milk pregnant. All of your grandmas, great grandmas, great, great grandmas were all drinking raw milk straight from the cow. And so when we have these recommendations that, um, you know, the doctors say, don't do this, don't do that. It's just to release themselves from liability. So do, I mean, is there potential for things that could happen? Yeah, but there's potential from you getting sick from eating spinach. So let's choose wisely, like where your source is coming from. Are you trusting mm-hmm. the places that you're getting your, your foods from? Um, so, you know, the majority of my clients are, are drinking raw milk and having sushi and, you know, they're, they're being intuitive with their bodies. Let's get into like the sticky and talk about vaccines. Oh, we're going to go there. <laughs> we have to go there. I think we have to go there. There's too much about it. There's too much, there's too much curiosity. There's too much awareness coming out about it. You know, one of my colleagues and good friends in the medical field is Dr. Robert Sears. He is two exits down the freeway from me. You know, we're really close in proximity and really close uh, as spiritual companions through this life. And he said it best recently, and he's always in trouble. So, you know, I, I, I do try to avoid topics that are like, you know, the hot topic because yeah. there's, there's persecution, you know, like, like one of the things I want to talk about is like the, the burning of witches. And it's like, no, this, this is still the burning of witches here. And so mm. we, we share a lot of common clients. I call them clients. Some people will call them patients. And what he said is that um, in his practice, he's been practicing pediatrics for 25 years. He has released a book called The Vaccine Book. He's done a lot of research. um, And he has a client base where when he started, the majority of his clients were questioning some, you know, vaccine choices. Um, and, And then as his practice evolved, everybody kind of saw him as the the pediatrician that would accept them. You know, a lot of pediatricians, if they're controlled by the insurance companies, will say, hey, we can't see you in our office. Like you need to find another pediatrician. And so he was the pediatrician with open doors that said, you know, I'm here to welcome you with the choices that you're making for your children as a responsible adult making autonomous choices based in best benefits, risks, and alternatives. And here are those benefits, risks, and alternatives. And what he found is that most people de- you know, decided not to um, adhere to the CDC you know, different, there's, it's, it's, it's always changing, but the recommendations that change every year. And what he saw is that in a practice that should have had a lot of children that were really sick from diseases that we're vaccinating from, were, were children that were actually really, really healthy. And if they did contract some of these, you know, pertussis, whooping cough type things that their immune systems were able to support them in a way where they, yeah, they got sick, but they, none of them had died. So statistically speaking, it doesn't really line up. And so, you know, he, what he also has seen on the contrary is people that have come to him because of injuries that had been had and he's watched those children recover. And then parents make choices outside of what Mm. they did the first time because they had seen an injury and, you know, pivoted to not have the same experience for future, for future children. And so it's just one of those, um, things that if we, we look at the numbers with, you know, and granted it's a small pediatric practice, but it still is, it's, it's relevant and it, it's, you know, and, and like I said, we share these clients. And so, a lot of people choose home birth because they don't want to have the same experience that they had before, which could right. involve injured children. For someone, because it's got to be a personal decision, intuitive, do what feels right for you, go do your research. Like, where would you point, where would you point, what direction would you point people in to do that research to make that decision for themselves? Yes. So it's definitely a personal decision. And it's something that I always say, like, always, always, always use informed 
consent while making right. those decisions. Like it's right. not a one size fits all medicine in general is not one size fits all. It should always be individualized. Um, Bob is a really good place to start. So the vaccine book you can get on Amazon, um, him and one of my former clients, Melissa Floyd uh, did a podcast called the vaccine conversation. Um, I think it's the vaccine conversation.org. I'll have to double check on it, but they have hours and hours and hours and hours of recorded, um, information. Um, specifically we could even talk about, we, there's a bill coming up in California that's going to require all 13 year old boys and girls to get the HPV vaccine to enter school. Oh, and so wow. they had a, a big, uh, conversation about the benefits, risks, and alternatives of the HPV vaccine. So there's just a lot of movement within that right now. And it's, it's really, you know, like it's, it's, it's pretty censored. Um, and so there's, you can definitely find information out there, but you have to, to look at the right places. So I, I, I would think the vaccine conversation podcast would be the perfect place to start. Mm -hmm. Did I hear something when I was listening to some things prepping about stillbirths and an increase in stillbirths in recent time? Mm -hmm. So the numbers aren't out all the way yet, but what we're starting to see is anywhere uh, up to an increase of stillbirths of 1700% since 2020. Nobody knows. I mean, people have their, their own conclusions, but there's nothing that has been, you know, in the medical community that says this is what's causing it. Also last week, uh, we had our uh, release of information about maternal mortality. So there's infant mortality and maternal mortality. Oh, and maternal yeah. mortality went up 40% from 2020 to 2021. 40, 40 percent. There's a lot of um, medical racism, if you will. There's there's disparities within different communities that the you know the I think it's 42.8 per 100,000 women that die are black compared to 12.1 that are white. Um, don't quote me on those exact statistics, but I think that's what it is. Um, and there's so many different ways that we can look at this, but 40% in one year. 1700%? Like, like, are you are kidding crazy me? Crazy right numbers. Now? They're crazy in numbers. And, and, you know, like our infant mortality rate, Cuba has a better infant mortality rate than the United States. What is going on? Is there really population control going on? Is there like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Because I mean, it just seems things are not sensical. Like mm -hmm. these are incredibly scary statistics. I mean, you know, you hear, you know, Bill Gates say that we need population control. And then you hear Elon Musk say, we are running out of people. Like we, there's not enough people. Yeah. We're going to, we're, this is a problem. Yeah. And I can see it from that side because I mean, here I am, I'm 40. Like I'm not having children. Like women are having them later. People are generally having less kids. I think Yeah. there's men have, men are, have more erectile dysfunction, have mm -hmm. lower uh, fertility rates. I mean, um, I think the testosterone rate has dropped 70%. Yeah. So like, like mean, that's a significant, huge thing. There's yeah. a, a doctor that talks about the, the um, shrinking of the perineum. The taint is what it's known as. And every year that the space in between the, our, as women, our perineum in between our vagina and our anus, and then as men in between the testicles and their anus is shrinking every year. There's actually something called micro penises now. My yeah, micro penises. That. Like I haven't come across one, thank God. But you know, well, it, but you know, I, I have in my practice. <laughs> like I, I had my ultrasound tech message me and be like, "This penis is really small," and I was like, "Shut up!" Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? And I mean, the baby came out with a micro penis, and this is a mom that takes really good care of herself. So where, where is that coming from? You know, like, like is it the plastics? Is it the the phytoestrogens? Is it? the glyphosate that's being sprayed all over every freaking thing. Even if you eat a organic, you know, it's in everything. Uh, the seed oils that we're like, what is it? What is it? You know, there's, it's a combination of all the things. Is it one thing? Who knows? Oh, before we get off of totally, um, children, I, I thought, I just wanted to ask about circumcision. One of the topics that I am most passionate about, actually, when I worked in the hospital, I had an office next to the newborn nursery. Uh -huh. And I remember the first day that I heard the scream of a newborn baby boy that was being circumcised. Mm. It printed to the depth of my soul. I will never forget it. It still makes 
everything in my body, every every ounce of my soul stand up and say that I will always be the voice of newborn baby boys that don't have a voice. So let's look at world circumcision rates, right? We are we are barely anybody circumcised in the world. Like we're at 80% of the world that's not circumcised. Okay. You're 40, I'm 41. When we were growing up, right? Everybody was circumcised. There yeah. were, there were, I mean, and if you had like one friend, I had, you know, a friend, John, who was from Argentina, he wasn't circumcised and everybody and knew. Everybody in America, for sure. Yeah. Everybody knew that there was I one. I had a friend who had a baby and she, you know, the other day she came home a couple of weeks ago and because he got circumcised that day. And you yeah. Know. Yeah. So now in the United States, that's, that's as a whole, the United States has dropped under 50% for circumcision. Um, in the Western states, in the Western states, we're right around 20%. Um, because a lot of insurance companies are not covering it because it's now being dubbed a cosmetic procedure because it is. Okay. So there is no medical benefit. The American Academy of Pediatrics sticks their head in the sand. They actually posted a graphic when they released their circumcision statement probably 15 years ago, and it was a bird with its head in the sand. Okay. Stop it. Yeah. So what we know is that Dr. Kellogg, Kellogg cereal, brought circumcision to the United States back in the late 1800s. And a lot of and fucking sugar for breakfast. Well, yeah, among a mil- million other things, right? And what he said is that this there's this puritanical belief system that if we circumcise boys, they wouldn't masturbate. Back then, they thought that masturbation led to insanity. Okay. So the basis, I mean, I know there's religious reasons. I get that. Like, I'm not, not talking about that. Okay. The basis of westernized medical circumcision is based on the assumption of Dr. Kellogg, who told us that guys wouldn't masturbate. Now we know that's not fucking true, right? Like, come on. Like they're not. We're not talking about Kellogg's cereal, are we? Yeah. Dr. Oh, Kellogg. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. was like, wait a second. I heard Kellogg and I just want to make yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah. So Dr. Kellogg brought this information in. Now, we could go into the spirituality of this, right? If we are to take a newborn baby boy out of the arms of a brand new mother and take it somewhere and cut off the most sensitive part of its body, right there, you have just dubbed control of that mother and her parenting relationship, right? Mm. Like, like, let that sink in. Mm. Like, like, it is so unmaternal to let anybody harm your baby. Yeah. But to have a medical professional come in and say that you have to to do this and cut off the most sensitive part of its body, that right there asserts control within the medical system immediately. Okay. So, you know, I could talk about this subject for hours and hours and hours. In my practice, my circumcision rate is maybe 2% at the most, and it's usually for religious reasons. Um, It's something that needs to be a conversation that's had on a regular basis. It needs to be a cultural shift. There is no reason that we should be performing a medical procedure that has a risk of death on a newborn baby. Death, yes, they can bleed to death from this. They can have... They can have mutations. There can be scar tissue. There can be, you know, like the crooked penis. You know, everybody, like there's something that people always talk about with the crooked penis. It's scar yeah. tissue that's pulling their penis to the side. Stop. Yeah. So it's it's definitely something that people should reevaluate. Um, you know, out of pocket now it's around six hundred dollars, and so a lot of people are choosing to not make that decision. But it shouldn't be because of a monetary reason. It should be because our bodies are perfect, <laughs> mm-hmm. and our baby boys are born whole, and there is no reason to. Uh, you know, it's this. It's the same thing as female circumcision. In my eyes, there's zero difference. Like, and everybody is all up in arms about female circumcision. Now it's Wait, same thing. Wait, what's female circumcision? So female circumcision is most common in Africa. It's And it's uh, typically done at a certain age in African tribes. And it's either uh, when they're closing together the labia or cutting off the labia. It's definitely a, a, like a conversation shift because for me, it would seem like, like a boy just doesn't want to be different than his friends. He doesn't want to, like, it seems there's like a perception of it being more dirty or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, it's not it's there's no difference than a, a, a man pulling his foreskin back and cleaning his penis than us cleaning our vagina in the shower. Like, it's the same thing. It's true. You know, it's totally true. Yeah. You know that the the Gates Foundation is behind the circumcision uh, in Africa. They say that it prevents HIV. They were going around and circumcising a bunch of Africans. I mean, how would that prevent HIV? I mean, you, you, you can lie with statistics any way you want. Right. Like they're saying that it reduced the 
sexually transmitted diseases. Well, let's talk about condoms. How about we go and give out condoms instead? I was in Egypt and <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Look at the car. Stop it. Stop pulled. it. Okay. Well, obviously, you know, I had to ask this question then. <laughs> just how the world works. Literally, works. I just fucking picked the card up like right now. People, if you don't believe in energy and you don't believe in the universe oh. and all this stuff, like you're missing it. Um, okay. When I was in Egypt on the walls, they, um, one of the, one of the, some of the hier hieroglyphics set showed basically what they were saying was childbirth and how women would kind of sit and like gravity would, squat. the baby would, would come out yeah. and it would be a far more, you know, natural process. Even like when you go to other countries and the toilet is, in the, the ground and you squat yeah. like it's uh -huh. you know and here in america we have a you know squatty potty, squatty potty. Where we have to put our feet up and yeah so it's kind of ergonomically correct and they said that it was man that wanted to watch this and be part of it and see this that women were then laid down so that the man could sort of like watch the process happen and be there or see it in a way that they like to see it yeah um that that things were changed is there any truth to that is there any truth to sort of the, <laughs> the way a baby's born has yes. been put into a like just twisted and flipped and turned and laid on a bed the wrong way yeah. So it, we need to look back a couple hundred years prior to even talking about women laying flat to give birth. So throughout all of time, birth was attended by midwives. Men weren't allowed. There's a, a wonderful book called The Red Tent that described the experience of how women would gather in these red tents and, uh, you know, they would menstruate together and it was all of their sisters and their aunties and their grandmothers. And they would share these experiences together. And you bet your ass when they were in labor, they would go back and be surrounded by these women. And of course, right. there was women that had more knowledge of birth and they were probably out collecting the different herbs in the field uh, that they knew would assist with, how, you know, the the mom having an easy birth. And, you know, I want you to know, imagine how elephants give birth. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but they circle around the, the elephant and they sway side to side in a circle. The, the, the elephant, nope, the, the mom's in the center, the elephant mom, the elephant women surround the, the elephant that's giving birth and they create this protective circle and they sway back and forth because it's this natural energy, right? When you're holding a baby, what's the first thing you naturally do? You just start this natural sway. And so that's how it's been throughout all of time. We've always been surrounded in these these circles of women, and uh, you know, there there's that that natural vibrational energy that moves through everybody in the room, that creates a safe sacred space. And um, when we look back throughout time about when that started to change, there was a book that was written um, in the Catholic Church um, in 1484. It was the Mal Malice Malf Malfurcrum, I always say it wrong. Um, and it basically translated to the witch's hammer. And so they, they brought this throughout Europe and they basically were saying um, at that time that the greatest threat to the church was midwives. Okay. So this is when the witch trials began and everybody always thinks of like the Salem witch trials. And that's like really the only thing that Hollywood has given us for the history. And I call it the her story. It's really not history. It's about her. Um, and they, they moved through the villages. And um, at that time, there was over 9 million women that were killed um, with, with the witch trial. And so I want you to think about this. So in Germany alone, there was 100,000 women that were murdered. And not just like midwives. Like it was literally like anybody that were was like, like women would be stripped naked in the middle of a town hall looking for birthmarks. Because if they had a birthmark, it was the mark of the devil um wow, women man. yeah women would be um you know like like a man would get an erection and say like that woman is magical and that woman would be burned at the stake They're like it wasn't like just childbearing women it was children it was grandmothers it was oh like God. lots and lots of women that nine were... million nine million why yes. is this history not known why is exactly. this exactly so Exactly. Um, and so it was a dark time in Europe. Uh, there was lots of famine. There was, I mean, if, if the mother figure, if the matriarch is missing, of course, it's going to be dark, right? And uh, at that point, they were thinking there's not enough uh, like laborers to work. So what they ended up doing is um, women knew their fertility prior to this. It was talked about in those red tents. The mm -hmm. average 
uh, you know, amount of women that children had was typically about three to four children. Once that was erased and the midwives, the herbalists, the family physicians didn't have the, you know, the education that they were bringing forth of how to know their fertility, the rates went to about 12 to 13 ch ch children in, in one family. So a mom, one mom would have 12 to 13 children, which was, is then child labor, right? That's why child labor laws and everything got started. And so... It, there was there was just injustice all over. Like there was no place that wasn't grim and awful. Um, and you know, men would even look at the menstruation as a streak of the devil. Like it was it was definitely a time where they were trying what to. Time, like what point in history was this? So it started at 1484. This is when the book came out, The Witch's Hammer. Um, and so it, it spread throughout. Now at that time we started, um, you know, think of Christopher Columbus, right? So we started having that uh, the, the immigration over to the United States. Now I promise you the Native Americans here knew what they were doing with birth, right? Like it was when we started having the like Westerners come over and bringing syphilis and all this weird shit and their Western priest doctors, and as these um, rates, the population started growing in the United States, they started to kind of come together with the church of some sort of like medicine, like, you know, the practice of medicine and medical school. Um, it, in 1700s, uh, women were not even allowed to step foot into medical school. So you know, think of that. Like any time that you got hurt growing up, any time that you were um, needing any sort of healing, most people would turn to their mom or their grandmother or you know some female figure. Never a male, typically. Like it was, it, you go to get comforted, comforted by the female mm -hmm. figure. So when they completely extracted the female from medical school in 1700, it really changed medicine to a a uh, profit driven controlled type of medicine. And so um you know you look back at 1972, right? That's not that long ago. And 90% of the doctors that were entering medical school were still male. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. been 500 years then since the it, yeah. extinction essentially of yeah. like the the medical medical woman. Yes. And so um during that time, there was also the slaves that were being brought over from um, Africa. And there wasn't as much of a forgotten history about the the midwives, the herbalists, all of that. They, they hadn't touched, they hadn't gone there to execute all of their witches down there, right? Mm -hmm. So as these slaves came, they they had this storytelling. They had the experience of witnessing their, their nanas and their aunties be midwives. And so this yeah. got brought into the United States. Yeah. These were called granny midwives and um, the granny midwives would go and they'd have really good outcomes. You know, birth was like starting to granny be midwives. Are these the African-Americans that have come over or are these mm -hmm. just slaves in general or like what were the, the African, granny? African-American slaves that were brought over that knew and had the knowledge of, yeah. of midwifery of, yeah. of, you know, a female practitioner that, yeah. that provided healing. They kept practicing. They kept practicing. So uh, in the 1900s, 19, in actually 1900, 100% of births in the United States were at home. Okay. Damn. 100%. Um, by the time that we got into the 1930s, 1940s, we were looking at about 50% of births that were then moved to the hospital. So they went on these smear campaigns with these granny midwives and they would post ads. Now, remember at that time who owned the media and still does was the Rockefellers right and they owned the newspapers and they owned all these things and so there would be pictures of these beautiful African-American women that were the granny midwives of the south and they would say that they were dirty and that they were you know killing moms and babies and don't associate with these women and um so the affluent people uh didn't want to have any association with these granny midwives. And so they they said, well, let's birth at the hospital. And so what ended up happening is these men would uh, go in and think that they controlled birth, right? So they would lay women flat on their back and they would give them a drug called scopolamine. Scopolamine is an eraser. So you're like anesthetized 
completely out of your fucking mind and you have no memory of it. You are, you have amnesia. It's like being it. like, it's like being like drugged in the club, like being drugged. It's like being roofied. Right. Roofy, yeah. And so what would happen is that these women were tied up, literally tied up to the beds. Okay. And their feet were put up in forceps. The doctor sat level with the with the chair at their vagina, and they would control these births. Now, if you can't really tell a, a mom that is under anesthesia directions, you can't say push or do this. So they would wait for the baby to start to come, and then they would go in with forceps, <clears throat> and they would pull these babies out. Well, cut the cl- cut the cord right away, whisk the baby away to a, another area. Put them in the nursery, right? Like that's all the pictures you see back then is the dad yeah. standing, smoking their cigars, looking at their babies in the nursery where the nurses attended to these babies. And and that was birth. That was birth. That was birth for a long time. I mean, I've seen scopolamine used um, in birth in my 20-year career in a hospital before. Um, and so, yes, there, you know, the, the history dates back to women being on their backs. And we know that squatting is one of the most universal positions for giving birth. Squatting increases the pelvic outlet by 33%. Um, but, but the reason that, that these women were placed on their backs is because they were drugged and it was convenient for the doctor to have them level with their feet up in forceps. Now, another thing that was happening around this time is there really wasn't universal precautions in terms of infectious disease. So these doctors in med school were going around and they were learning all of these different things and they would go from an autopsy in another room, not wash their hands, come in and catch a baby, I shouldn't say catch, deliver a baby. And these women would then die of sepsis because the person that the doctor saw in the other room that was dead and they were doing an autopsy on had some sort of infectious disease that was then passed to the woman. So the darkness of this still, I mean, it's still relevant. I mean, we had a 40% increase in maternal mortality rate from 2020 to 21. It's not getting better. Right. You know, and so we we just need to step back and go like, what are we doing wrong here? Like, you know, like like there's there's ancient hieroglyphics on these pyramids in Egypt of women squatting to give birth to their babies. Right. Where did it go wrong? You know, like like the advancements in medical technology sure save a few babies, but and moms, but like we're going backwards now. We're going yeah. backwards, and you can so still use that you can still save them. Oh, of you course, have, right? you can still, but you can go back and implement the practices of normal physiological birth are natural. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, wow. um, it's, <clears throat> it's, <throat> it's, it's, but, but let's bring it back to this, that, that we are the generation that our grandparents and that our few past I'm generations waiting. had been waiting for. So we get to take this victimhood out of it, right? Like it's, that's a, that's a really dark history, her story. That's, that's dark. That's dark. But we get to step into our power. We get to step into our worth and we get to change this. And, you know, instead of like ending on this doom and gloom statement, I want to, I want to finish with another breath together. Um, And I, I want, this breath to be a collective breath where we imagine tying a a red tie, like a red string around us and then out into all the other people on this planet. Like there's no division. There's no reason for this division. So really quick, just take a deep breath and settle back into your body. That's a fiery topic. I just got worked up with that. And just be present in your body. There is a beautiful Mexican proverb that states they tried to bury us and what they didn't realize is that we were seeds. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to imagine winding a red string around your wrist and I'm going to send that red string right to you. But as we connect our hearts and connect our wombs, we're also going to connect with everyone on this planet. Because everyone on this planet has had some story that involves the beginning of life with violence, that involves the beginning of life with fear. And this is where we get to change that. This is where we get to make a difference in our future for our children, for our children's children. This is where we get to step outside of the control 
and realize the only control that they have is when we're divided. So in a space of neutrality where there's no good and no bad, I want you to just come back to your center and come back to your knowing and come back to your remembering that it is our inherent right to have body autonomy, to make choices for ourselves and our families without being controlled. And an amazing thing I heard last week from Zach Bush, who I know you've had on the show, Mm -hmm. is that when a mama blue whale calls, calls to her baby, that the vibration of that sound travels around the globe five times before it dissipates. So right now I ask you all to be that mama blue whale and let the energy of this conversation reverberate around this earth, this world, this globe that we're living on. All of your sisters and all of your brothers to come back to your remembering. So it is. So it is. That's amazing. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, of course. You said you had two questions. I just remembered to be. I did. I did. The other one was about um, vegan vegetarians. Yeah. yeah, The hot topic. Um, You don't have to go too far into it. Just like your perspective and just, you know, I've I've heard you talk about how the placentas look completely different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just, I just think that it's such a curious space for people right now. And look, I get that. I mean, I love animals too, but it's kind of like them or me. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, if I had to go kill it myself, I would struggle. And Mm -hmm. I promise you it would be a ceremony if I did, because Mm -hmm. it's not something I would want to do, but I do think that there's a, a, a quick sort of like overview from your perspective and what you see with women that don't eat meat. Yeah. So (laughs) <laughs> there was just a documentary, a mini documentary that came out with Dr. Paul Salcido called Nourished. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, he's great. He's a wonderful person. Extreme. I love him to death, but you know, like Very he's extreme. like, like carnivore or nothing. And yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not an all or nothing type of human. I am a, a person that likes to have balance. And so um, what I like to say is once we come back to our ancestral way of eating, it was never just plants. We had, uh, you know, gathered in these villages and our men would be out hunting and they would bring back um whatever, a bison, an elk, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And every piece of that animal would be deeply revered and used. So every organ, nose to tail, as we say, right? And what we know, historically speaking, reading through literature, is that the pregnant women were the ones that received the the organs um, and the the higher fat content of meat because they knew that was what grew babies healthy. Um, Back then, there was no scientific labs where we were making pharmaceutical supplements. Supplements are just that, supplements. Uh, Mm -hmm. supplementing to what we're eating. Um, There was also no scientific labs where we were trying to reproduce meat, such as something like beyond meat and, and, you know, trying to have this weird composition of God only knows what I, I call it cat food, but (laughs) um, those, those things didn't exist. It's, it's consumerism that's driven that, right? Like those, those were things that never existed before. And so in my experience, what I've seen, and, you know, it's anecdotal, there's not a lot of research. The research is, is censored because it's, you look right now at who's making these, you know, the Bill Gates Gates companies. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, and Bill Gates is buying up all of our farmland too. So, Mm -hmm. um, when we look at it, we see that, um, the, the, best place for mom to nourish a baby is really back <clears throat> to our ancestral way of eating. And have I seen vegans that have gone through the pregnancy and actually eaten well, not like stuff out of a box, but like really done a good job at taking care of themselves? Mm-hmm. Yes. Like I that's I, I would never say that you can't make it through a pregnancy healthy if you're vegan or vegetarian. But what I'd see is that most people don't know how to eat right if they're a vegan or vegetarian. 
it's it's really a lot of store-bought junk um heavy in carbs which then spikes insulin levels up and uh, sugar levels up um in my practice i the the big like like placental abruptions, which means the placenta detaches off the uterine wall before the baby's born. Um, partial abruptions have been from my vegetarian vegan moms. My full placenta abruption was from a raw vegan. Um, and uh, I just find that even if it's just for baby growing, that uh, women, if they listen to their intuition, they usually start craving meat. Um, it's something that happens quite often. And then I don't care if you feel like you want to go back to being vegetarian or vegan once you're done being pregnant, do it, please, by all means, you know. Um, but but what I've seen in my experience is that uh, babies just come out more robust and healthy and moms moms do better uh like especially in the postpartum they're they're well fed well mineralized they have really good fats going to their brain which we know affects depression um and it's just one of those little nuances that uh over the 20 years of experience that i have that that's that's my anecdotal observation yeah well it's a value as you've seen so many so thank yeah. you yeah of course have you ever read the Magdalene manuscript? It's a lot of Magdalene energy that's that's within birth, and the the Magdalene energy is is something that's been coming up a lot for me. And yeah, uh, me too. it's it's I think it's part of the the energy of the elevation of the Earth right now. I think yeah. that those those ley lines throughout our Earth right now are mm -hmm. being really activated, and um, I feel that I have female lineage somewhere back to the Magdalene line. Like I've felt that my whole entire life. And Isis, it goes through Isis too. It's really the cult of Isis that Mary Magdalene practiced under in the mystery school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I'm curious your thoughts about it all, but basically the book goes into describing it's a transmission from Mary Magdalene through, uh, through a channeler. Mm -hmm. And she talks about her experience on earth with, Jesus, Yeshua, and how she was within the cult of Isis and they practiced sex magic. And mm -hmm. like sex has been turned into this super taboo thing that we don't talk about. It's dirty. It's all these things, but it was an insanely powerful practice. And so she used sex with Yeshua to increase his, the power, the strength of his Ka body, which is the etheric sort of second body, the energetic body around you. Mm -hmm. And it strengthened him for what he ended up going through, but that was part of what she learned in, in the mystery school. And it was in, in, and to basically it's how you move the energy during orgasm mm -hmm. and, um, and that it was a, it's a, it's a sacred, powerful practice that I don't think we look at like that, like at all now. I mean, yeah. except for making a baby is really like the kind of like some of the magic, I guess. Right. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think we need to adopt from the lessons from Mary Magdalene or the Magdalene energy moving forward in the, in the, in that area of sex? And, you know, we're talking about, you know, the fact that AIDS is something Bill Gates is trying to help, but maybe just don't have sex and then you don't have to worry about it. Right. So like, yeah. how do we reorient to the sacredness, the, the, the magic and the power of sex versus what it's become. So this goes back to birth for me because birth in itself is a very sexual experience. Um, birth can be an orgasmic experience. It's, it can be an ecstatic experience. And, uh, you know, what we look back in history and the Catholic church did a really good job of halting that sexuality. Um, they, they said at one point that if a, a mom became, a woman became pregnant, that it was the doings of the devil and that child wouldn't be considered holy until a male priest laid hands on that child. So there's so many deep rooted shameful things that come from sexuality. I mean, that's where our woman woman magic is. That's where our power is, right? Like the power of moving that kundalini orgasmic energy through ourselves and connecting us up into the heavens and back down into the earth is our power.
Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, look, like when you move the energy, like they tell you to move it in the book and you go up the spine, up the chakras all the way up. It's kind of freaking cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's intimidating for some people, right? Like when they first experience, they're like, Oh shit, I didn't know I had that much power. Um, you could, you could connect all of that energy. And I, I know Mary Magdalene was a midwife. Like she was a divine healer midwife. And, uh, you, you connect all of that energy back into the spiral, right? Like there's that, that serpent that dances up the spine and it's always this divine dance. And there's the sexual energy, which in essence is also birth energy and in the weaving of the masculine and the feminine, it's, you know, there was never supposed to be a division between the two. Like there's this, this beautiful, you know, matriarchy and this, uh, very, egocentric patriarchy it's supposed to be married it's supposed to be in balance we're not supposed to have the division that we have today and you know you, you do your research on when division started and i know it's started way before this but the the actual timelines of what's historically recorded is that we look at uh when people started like tattling on each other when people started coming into villages and and executing women because of these sacred powers that we had that were magic and and they were all burned you know like it's 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 all connected it's all connected which then makes us scared of sexuality because a we're we're forced to step back into our power which we've been it's been beaten out of us for so many years so many generations and then we get to realize that within us is divinity, right? We don't get to go search for it somewhere else. It's within us. Yeah. And so there's, there's, it's a lot of different shifts that have to happen within oneself to even identify that these are things that can come up and, and transform us. People just don't talk about it. No. You find that even with the women that you work with who are definitely more progressive and in touch, like, do they even have a problem talking about like, what's the conversations that need to happen around sex to start to get comfortable with the, with, with talking about it and the power of it? I think we need to step back into, we need to start with our children. Like, like we need our children to see the beauty of a naked female body, you know, like, like I take my daughter to um, a Korean spa and everybody's naked there. You know, you go to Europe, everybody's naked. Mm. And my daughter sees all these different body types and she sees mm -hmm. the elders and she sees the maidens and she sees what all the different variations of normal are. That in itself is the start of the sensuality and the sexuality of experiencing the female body. And, you know, we, we look at our periods when, when we start, menstruating like i remember when i started my period i was it was like shameful I, I you know i found my my grandmother who who actually made it a beautiful experience but you know it was like something that you don't talk about and you hid your your pads in your backpack god forbid one fall out and a boy see that you're on your period sure or like holding a tampon or anything yeah you're, like, you're trying to hide that stuff like you know, still to today yeah so the conversation is really missing within um I don't think it needs to be based in schools. I think it should be based within family units. I think that we need to talk about our basal body temperatures. I think that we need to talk about what different stages of discharge look throughout our cycle, what it looks like to be fertile, what it looks like to not be fertile. Mm -hmm. um, and then come into the awareness and the practice of keeping the conversation about sexuality very sacred so it's not just like a one-off conversation like it's it's something that's a ceremony yeah. like we sit down and have these these conversations with our with our daughters when my daughter turned 11 she was in fifth grade um i hosted a puberty right like for all the girls in our class and yeah. what we went through is was something in the sense of um like a mother blessing, like a, a, a blessing way where we all sat, the, the mothers all sat together in a circle and we all lit a candle and we all spoke as we lit the candle about what we loved about the sacredness of our femininity. And all of these like tweens got to sit and listen. And, um, yeah. you know, they were embarrassed and thought we were crazy, but I promise you that imprint is with them for the rest of their life. 100%. And it opens the conversation that these conversations can still be had further on. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of work that we need to do a lot. Yeah. Um, 
and, and even with within ourselves as adult women, like we don't know like the total extent power of our sexuality because sexuality is not ceremony anymore. You know, it's unless you consciously make it that it's just that's not usually our experience. I want to talk a little bit about infertility just because I think so many so many women struggle with it. And mm -hmm. there's obviously so many more medical modalities now for that. I mean, even myself, like I froze my eggs when I was 33 mm -hmm. because I didn't know where I was going with my life exactly in that area. I didn't know if it was something I even wanted to do, but I was like, oh, let's just like cover my bases here. Yeah. Um, so if someone's struggling with fertility, what things do you recommend? So the First things first is we usually start with emotional stuff. Um, we go through traumas. We we dig deep into what is the fears around becoming a mother. What is the fears and in, in starting a family? Both sides, you know, both both uh, male female. Uh, it's it's all the energy that it takes to create a baby. You, you have to include. Remember, it's like that marrying of the two energies. So. We start with the emotional side. Now, of course, we can go into the like different herbs to take and the, you know, proper nutrition to have to help with fertility. Um, but what I typically recommend doing is, is coming up with some sort of a, uh, you know, preconception plan, like writing a letter to your spirit baby, writing a letter with all of the attributes that you want to, you know, bring with this baby's life. Stepping into a place of realizing that you aren't this baby's teacher, that you are this baby's student. And I know that's a really hard shift for parents to make. Mm -hmm. That's a total flip. Total flip. So honoring that what they're coming forth and bringing to this world and to your lives is something that are deep lessons for you. Um, it, it's... There's it a might make a lot of women think twice about having a kid. They're like, wait a minute. <laughs> and I'm sure all the mothers are agreeing with me right now. Oh, I bet there. once you have it, you're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. It's my greatest lessons, greatest yeah. test. Exactly. Um, there's a beautiful book called The Spirit Baby. Um, and, you know, another quick Amazon buy. And it's it's something that is, is calling that um, soul, that ethereal being into your consciousness. Yeah. Um, these babies, uh, you know, in my opinion, and uh, again, I, I sit at the portal of of life, and I, I I sit at the portal of death too. I've I've helped transition a lot of humans out of this world too, mm. and uh, I think that they they kind of wherever they're at, floating around up in the heavens, wherever it, that they sit up and they they consciously pick, you know, who they're gonna go to, who they're gonna interact with. Um, have you read the book? Sacred Contracts by Carolyn Mize. No. Oh, that's a good one. You'll have to read that because it's yeah. it goes Sacred into contracts. yeah, it goes into us uh having these experiences here on earth and each person good or bad uh you know teach us these lessons that are deep within our souls that are what we needed for our contract here on this earth. And so um you know, I always say that there's a welcoming committee and that there's a death com committee and you know, I the, the the first hands, the first voices, the first light that gets to be in that space to either welcome or help a soul depart are are part of that process. So there's there's so much spirituality in all of it. And I think if you bring it back into the infertility part of it, it, it you lose that. Like it's there's no spirituality if you're in an infertility clinic. And so so often I see clients that are like, oh shit, I've tried for so many years. And then they go into fertility and they let go and they surrender <laughs> to things that they can't control. And they it's end the up margarita pregnant. baby. It's when you finally let go of wanting to have yes. a baby and you just go get wasted on tacos and tequila and yeah. have sex that night. And then all of a sudden you're like, and I'm pregnant. Yeah. All of a sudden it's like, yeah, yeah it's, the, totally. like you're, it's one of those stories that comes up all the time. Like, Women finally let go. Yeah. Or they're in the process of adoption. And then once they're matched with the baby, they become pregnant because all the stress is gone. What do you feel um, for yourself has been, you know, sort of the most important lesson that you've learned through all of your experiences with these women, with the energies of birth and yourself and, and um, that you think about every day? It's really what's been echoed throughout this conversation. It's, um, I, I, I laugh all the time and like, like say like, God, 
fucking damn it. Like I've learned my lesson in patience in this life because that's what birth is, is patience, right? Like I mm -hmm. sit and wait a lot. Um, I have come back to the deep remembering within my soul. Mm -hmm. I I know the work that my grandmothers and my great great grandmothers and all of my female lineage has done in order for me to be here now, right? Like, yeah. like we started the conversation with, like, like they chose us to come now. And if I move away from that deep remembering and I move away from that surrender, then I move away from myself, and I continually remind myself in moments of not feeling connected that the only thing I need to do to connect back with myself is to be back within myself take a deep breath like slow down like be em patient embody myself be patient surrender um and and just know that you know things that are happening that I move throughout the day with are happening to me for a reason that's mm. it's that that divine trust. surrender trust trust the process trust the process yeah wow. yeah that's beautiful wow thank you Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.